<clears throat> in this uh, in this session, I'm I'm again doing something more of a of a talk, uh, but then I'm I'm hoping to again have some a uh, bit more time for some uh, some conversation around it. Uh, <clears throat> if you happen to buy the uh, the book. Um, uh, not the scandalous Jesus, but the historical Jesus goes to church. Kind of an early form of this paper is in that uh, is in that uh, uh, volume, and so it's <clears throat> um, it, it might be a way to get the cliff notes on the on the text there. Um, wh one of the reasons the essay remains kind of fresh for me is, is because I focus there on the parables. Uh, of Jesus, which took as their starting point not the temple, but scenes from ordinary life. Um, I wanted to reflect on prayer and practice um, in, in a way that was really not focused on petitionary prayer or, um, or praise as such, but really as an opening up of ourselves. Um, an opening up of ourselves to the, the calling of our lives, um, both within but then also out of the church into public life. And so the parables, by virtue of not being focused on the sacred space of the temple, but on the kind of the sacred space of the ordinary, uh, seem to me to be a real possibility um, for this. I want to begin by talking about or quoting a 1968 essay, Contemplation in a World of Action, by, by Thomas Merton, a uh, famous Catholic uh, monk. He was beginning to move out of his own deeply embedded, I would say, platonic assumptions about prayer. If you read his early work, Seven Story Mountain and those kind of texts, really quite a classical theology that's informing his work. Here he begins to move out of it. He argued that, quote, official contemplative life as it is lived in our monasteries needs a great deal of rethinking because it is still too closely identified with patterns of thought that were accepted 500 years ago but which are completely strange to modern persons. So I hope this sounds familiar given the light of our previous discussion. Here's a bit of a longer quote from Merton. <clears throat> Experience of the contemplative life in the modern world shows that the most crucial focus for contemplative and meditative discipline and for the life of prayer for many modern persons is precisely this so-called sense of absence, of desolation, even the apparent inability to believe. I stress the word apparent because though this experience may be painful, to some and confusing, raising all kinds of crucial religious problems. It can very well be a sign of authentic Christian growth, he writes, and a point of decisive development in faith if they're able to cope with it. This is pretty honest language coming from a, from a monk. The way to cope with it, he says, is not to regress to an earlier and less mature stage of belief, to stubbornly reaffirm and to enforce feelings, aspirations, and images that were appropriate to one's childhood and first communion. Which again is, I think, what many of the religious options, the conservative options, have in fact in some ways chosen, to, to regress to a kind of literalism, to regress to a kind of doctrinalism that is then as simply affirmed as, and I believe it. One must, on a new level of meditation and prayer, he says, live through this crisis of belief and grow to a more personal and Christian integration of experience. Given that he wrote that in 1968, right, it still seems to me to be a kind of a vital statement of where many in the church still are. And it seems to surface many of the kinds of questions that haunt our own experience of faith. So today I want to look at the sayings and parables of Jesus, at least a few of them, to provide both a warrant and a model for the kind of skepticism that discloses resources for renewing thoughtful processes of prayer and practice. One often doesn't associate skepticism with prayer. But I hope to try to argue that in some ways this is what's going on in the parables. 
Jesus is pressing his audience to be skeptical, not just of authorities, but also perhaps of themselves, in order to open up, in order to open up a moral vision, a religious vision that goes deeper. Um, and that in some ways then challenges us to keep growing. Evident to even the, the casual reader of the Gospels is that Jesus is not a philosopher in the style of Plato or Aristotle, arguing from first principles. Instead, Jesus uses the conventions of Israel's religious and cultural heritage. What I found most helpful in the Jesus seminar's attempt to sift the Jesus tradition for words and acts, most probably his own, is the emergent sense of a rhetorical voice engaging the available conventions of his first century audience, his first century Jewish audience, one would say. In his sayings, in his parables, and table manners, and miracles, Jesus was engaged in a project aimed at healing the divisions within Israel and its neighbors, wrought in large part by the policies of the Pax Romana. And here, I mean, one can read again in the work of, say, a John Dominic Crossan or a Marcus Borg or, or my colleague, uh, New Testament colleague Brandon Scott's work on the parables, kind of the, the background of that political and cultural uh, life. In his language of the kingdom or empire of God, Jesus urged his audience to be that Israel where God's kingdom and not Rome's kingdom was fully established. And where Israel therefore lived out its vocation to seek justice for all its people and its neighbors, to welcome the stranger, to help carry one another's burdens. But that kingdom of God, at least in the parables, was not located in the temple. Perhaps Jesus saw it as already too occupied by Roman influence. The, sto the story of Jesus overturning the tables in the temple may or may not be an historical event. But shifting, or by shifting the primary location of where one experienced God's presence from the temple and the authority of its leadership to the midst of ordinary peasant life, Jesus challenged both cultural elites and peasants to see God differently. I certainly don't want to suggest that God could not be experienced apart from the temple in Jewish life. Nonetheless, I do think that what Jesus is doing in terms of focusing these parables in the midst of public life is something quite distinctive. In the sayings and parables that I examine here, and I think I'll do just uh, about three of them, the issue of seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G, of seeing, is important both to the action of the parable and to its effects on Jesus' audience. The concern with sight in these parables is not the same as a desire here if, uh, that uh, contemporary philosophers like Richard Rorty, um, a kind of a desire for epistemological foundationalism, right? This is not what the parables are interested in. They're not trying to identify points of certainty. Um, and, and there are some wonderful studies on, on sight that, uh, that argue that uh, kind of, of uh, a viewpoint um, in, in modern philosophy. Rather, as I will argue, the parable's metaphorical concerns with seeing tend to work in the direction of a kind of skepticism, of breaking down the peasants and others listening in, taken for granted assumptions about the sacred and political organization of their world. And by prompting the response of skepticism toward political and religious authorities, but also to themselves. Jesus enabled in his hearers an acknowledgement not only of their skepticism, but also of their agency. Thus, their capacity to see and act differently. If you follow the parable, you're going to be confronted with the limitations of your conventional worldview, but then also you're going to be invited into a different kind of response. So in this first story of an angry Jew about a good Samaritan, in this story of a Jewish man beaten, robbed, stripped of his clothing as well as his dignity, Jesus turns the frustrations of his hearers first onto Israel's religious elite, then onto themselves. Christians have tended to see in the Samaritan the figure of Christian Gentiles who, doing out of love what the Jewish authorities failed to do because of the law, surpassed the Jewish covenant. 
What the Christian view fails to account for, however, is Jesus' own audience and what they would have heard. Brandon Scott has reminded readers of the importance of the wounded man's nakedness, that apart from clothing that would indicate social class, the man becomes truly anonymous. Thus, neither the priest nor Levite nor Samaritan can know the identity of the wounded Jewish man in the ditch. By having the figures of the Jewish priest and Levite both see and pass by the wounded man, however, Jesus prompted the skeptical question of whether purity, of whether purity and legal obligations fully enact the life that Israel should lead. Right? In other words, the, the desire not to become impure by touching this man in the ditch and therefore having a moral justification for moving on. Jesus wants to say, wait a minute. Right? Are you in fact trading out what is the core ethical imperative to help the person in need? In fact, the parable suggests that knowledge of the law can enable the denial of the educated and priestly classes, blinding them to the more basic and urgent need of acknowledging their neighbor. However, Jesus does not leave the ethics of peasant Jews alone either. Uh, Bob Funk and others have, have, have really done a wonderful job of exposing this because they would say in the typical kind of Jewish story, you would have, yes, you could skewer the priests, you could skewer the Levites, but then the ordinary Jewish person would be the hero of the story. And then that would kind of reinforce a kind of, of, of group identity among themselves. Right? While initially encouraging peasant suspicions of literate classes, Jesus' use of the Samaritan as a hero skeptically asks whether anyone in his audience would have acted differently from the priest or the Levite. And there's a real offense when you bring in this enemy of the Jewish people to actually do the right thing. As the parable makes painfully obvious, even a Samaritan can see, hence the emphasis on seeing, what needs to be done, and even worse, the Samaritan does it before the Jew. Thus the parable urged an acknowledgement on the part of Jesus' audience that possessing the law, the temple, the Sabbath, whatever revelation one wanted to tout as marking one's superiority and uniqueness was of no advantage if one used them to deny the more fundamental imperative of caring for those in need. By calling the ultimacy of those traditions and cultural possessions into question, Jesus left no boundary between the Jew and the Samaritan, and thus no boundary to the kingdom of God. Which again puts on the, the table for his audience, how do you then act? How do you then respond? Right? And this parable is framed, at least as we, as we have it, in response to a question, who is my neighbor? Right. Considering lilies, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as one of these. The saying taken from Q uh, is found in both Matthew and in Luke. According to the seminar fellows, it is part of what may be the, quote, longest connected discourse that can be directly attributed to Jesus, excepting some of the longer parables. The verse is part of a broader discourse addressing anxiety about basic bodily needs and is addressed, quote, to those who are preoccupied with day-to-day -day existence. So verse 25 in Matthew, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? More gentle than the story of the Samaritan, Jesus' sayings here also encouraged his favored peasant audience, and they are his favored audience, to be somewhat skeptical of their own anxieties for the sake of a bigger picture. You can almost hear a kind of Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, in a way, but that's, that's a little uh, anachronistic, so I'll come back on it. The preoccupation, though, with bodily needs which is obvious in those who are homeless or who those who are, who are in poverty, given the crushing poverty of the Roman Empire. The peasant audience to be somewhat skeptical of their anxieties for the sake of a bigger picture is present here. The preoccupation with bodily needs suggested Jesus could prevent one from seeing, there again, the seeing piece, what is really needed, namely community, 
obsessed with pursuing those basic needs, one might trade away one's dignity, becoming a virtual slave to and for food. Alternatively, the preoccupation with survival needs could enable a kind of denial about the other real needs of life, such as mutual regard, community, forgiveness, which Jesus also goes on and on about. Philosopher, uh, mid-20th century Hannah Arendt attributed to Jesus the key pivotal moral insight about forgiveness. Right? That forgiveness was an integral part of public life. Insofar as poverty tears at the basic fabric of community by pitting the destitute against one another, isolating them by their, comp their competition for scarce resources, the parable urged his hearers to remember that that behavior could not grow a community, much less the kingdom of God. By turning to examples from nature like lilies of the field or birds of the air, Jesus encouraged his listeners to see an integrity set apart from any economic, political, or religious power to shame. Arguing from the convention that God provides for the creatures of the earth, Jesus urged a constructive confidence in place of a destructive anxiety. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first a community that pursues the common good. If by the phrase kingdom of God, Jesus meant something like living as a just Israel, even and perhaps especially in the face of Roman occupation, then both ruling elites and peasants would need the courage to be skeptical about their self-protective actions. A just Israel would resist the moral corruption of Roman occupation by refusing to treat one another the way the Romans wanted them to treat one another. The last one here will be hiding leaven. I've been deeply influenced by my colleague Brandon Scott's reading of the parable, according to which Jesus shifted the assumption of God's active location from purity to impurity. Right? In part because, as uh, Steve Patterson and others have, have argued, in, under the strains of, of poverty, one couldn't, one couldn't stay morally pure. One inevitably became impure. So Jesus in this, in, this, in this parable really turns things upside down by calling attention, by, by, by saying that God is present in impurity, not purity. And then there's also a kind of a critique of the temple that's uh, at play here. There, here is uh, Scott. For all those who are leaven in their society, I'm quoting here. For all those who are leaven in their society, who are impure, unclean, unwanted, this parable assures them that the empire of God is like them. In Jesus' society, this was a large majority of the people. All those who were unable for one reason or another to observe the purity code would be leaven. And that would be most folks, given that political situation. Of course, for all those who were doing well under the current regime, this parable would be bad news. God was not like what they imagined or the scriptures had predicted. God was not like unleavened bread, but leavened. The boundary of the sacred established by the feast of unleavened bread is eliminated. All right. Jesus goes after and begins to recast this parable. Is it, can you see that it's the impure? Very counterintuitive who are the people of the kingdom of God. So leaven associated with the processes of decomposition and rot accomplishes in nature what skepticism achieves in discourse. The dismantling of what seemed true, pure, holy, whole. That Jesus associates the kingdom of God with that corrupting process suggests that what was thought to be pure may not be and vice versa. You almost hear a little bit of Socratic skepticism coming to play. When I moved to Tulsa in 1992, it was Brandon who told me that I needed to visit the Community of Hope one Sunday evening. The Community of Hope was overseen by a United Methodist uh, Church. Its pastor, Leslie Penrose, was ordained by the Methodist Church. But because this congregation was mostly a community of GLBTQI persons, the United Methodist could not acknowledge it as one of its legitimate congregations. Leslie Penrose had been a student at Phillips, and that's how Brandon knew her. In his 2001 book, Reimagine the Parables, Scott wrote, I went for four weeks 
to the community of hope and have remained for eight years. What I found was a community where the parables formed the heart and soul of the community's life. From then, from them, I have seen how the dynamic of the parables works its way through the life of a community. He continues, I frequently draw on the parable of the leaven with church groups because it gives such a powerful insight into Jesus' vision. But usually the parable scares congregations. They can't believe their ears. They find it blasphemous. The reason is simple. Most middle-class Americans those who inhabit the world of mainline Christian churches belong to what he calls the default world, the conventional world against which the parable is reimagining the kingdom of God. They intuitively sense that they are the parable's target. But the community of hope, he writes, immediately sensed was at stake because the parable related their life story. As gays and lesbians, they were the leaven of this society. Many had been asked to leave a church, or at least had felt unwelcomed and judged. Many, through a long journey from self-hatred to self-acceptance, had at least come to see that they were loved and cherished. For them, the leaven was their story. As one said, the kingdom of God is like a queer. Maybe not here. Excuse me. In each of these parables, we as hearers are called and pushed, really, to be skeptical of our own religiously imbibed assumptions, precisely in order to go deeper, precisely in order to see differently. And I'm not speaking primarily about our intellectual assumptions, but our emotional, emotional and ideological ones, ones that are perhaps more in our heart than in our head and therefore more difficult to challenge. Those ingrained assumptions in our religious and political systems of our purity, or in other senses of our impurity, depending where we are, our sense of superiority or privilege, or perhaps even our inferiority or shame, our difference from those other people. Jesus wants to push at those assumptions in part because it is the intent of many, perhaps most political regimes, to divide people. You divide to conquer. Jesus wants his hearers as a community to question those deep, emotional, ideological assumptions by challenging them with the image of the kingdom of God. Like Jesus hearers, I believe we need to learn to see God differently. I believe that the tendency to equate faith with assent to the doctrinal claims of the Christian tradition can actually blind us to the call of Jesus' gospel. Locked in models of prayer, both corporate and private, that accentuate the image of an omnipotent, supreme being living beyond the world to whom we humbly lift our minds and hearts, we fail to see, to see again, the sacred in the midst of public life. As I was thinking about this, I remembered a sermon that, that famous process theologian John Cobb delivered when he, when he came to Phillips Theological Seminary about eight to 10 years ago. I think he was 90 at the time. And I was just astounded by his remarks because in the sermon he spoke not of his significant achievements in process theology or in his career. Instead, he spoke confessionally of moments in his own professional life where using the image from Acts 9, 1 to 19, the scales fell from his eyes and his sight was transformed. In those moments, he was turned around. In the sermon, he speaks of how he came to see the profound destructiveness, the sinfulness of Christian anti-Jewishness, the Christian of Christian misogyny, the hatred of women, of Christian participation in the abuse of the earth, which he would then go on to write at a route at length, and Christian oppression of GLBTQI persons. And as he told each of those stories, we see his own capacity for skepticism finally helping him come to terms with that blindness. A skepticism that brings as well the transformation of his voice now as a significant advocate on those issues. Cobb has turned the story of scales falling from Paul's eyes into a contemporary parable of his own transformation. 
In the process, Cobb helps relocate what we mean by the language of faith, away from belief and truth claims of the church and into the practices of standing with others, of resisting political bullying, of risking compassion and care across the boundaries of religion and race, class, and culture. Faith calls us out of our fear into courage to speak, to stand, to move. I don't mean to dismiss Christian traditions as much as call for the innovation of prayers and practices and liturgies that are themselves schooled in the critical and life-giving activity of the parables that reflect on public life. By returning to the importance of the public, I hope to return to some sense of mystery, sacrality, and gravitas to public life and our shared responsibility for it. Too often in church, the church becomes a place where we retreat from the world, not a place where we engage it. That democratic impulse is also a spiritual impulse, broadening, stretching the fabric of who matters and why. At the more basic level, the public level of church participation, one might well ask, well, if the body of God is encountered primarily in the world and, and not in the church, then what is the value of belonging to a church community? And here I would say much in every way. Much in every way. Simply put, the, the point involves prayer and practice. The practice of hospitality. Practicing respect. We come to a community where in some sense we experience others who precisely because we are gathered here in the name of, is it a gospel? Is it a sense of, the, of our own mission to the world? Our own sense, and by mission to the world, I mean to the common good. Where we with one another in a sense of trust practice a kind of real humility. We listen to one another. We practice conversation, we practice disagreement, we practice being community. We practice the disciplines of being a body politic, sharing discourse, and at the same time negotiating our disagreements, but also our common faith. So that we can grow in embodying and enacting the virtues of public life in a way that challenge and inspire others. What we have thought of the time of private, personal prayer, often in church, can now become a space in which we rehearse and not flee from the call to engage in public life. Beginning with our community of faith, beginning with the kind of, of diversity, of, different, of difference that we affirm in the gathered community itself. But this call doesn't stop at the, within the church, but draws us out. And in this space, both personal and shared, we sit with and confront our fears of that public engagement. In prayer, we practice values of respect, not just toleration. The respect in which we're open to being changed by the other, of hospitality. Hospitality here, not as, oh, you're coming to our space and we'll host you as appropriate and you better, belong, you, you better behave as a guest. But no, hospitality is a readiness, whether we are host or guest, to welcome strangers, to welcome one another. A compassion that, deserves the dig that preserves the dignity of one's enemies. Of skepticism toward our own as well as others' interests. Of anger in the face of injustice against persons, and in our time especially as well against the earth. In other words, we practice a new set of deeply held emotions. And we come to those emotions only through deeply practicing them. Right? We, we, we come to share a different kind of, of a worldview, perhaps even an ideology, by virtue of the fact that we have rehearsed it and practiced it. We've heard challenging sermons. We've, we've engaged in processes of ritual. But we've also, also encountered in those rituals new interpretations that have kind of given new meaning to what's going on in those rituals. 
And the nurturing of those emotions also requires the development of shared memories and communities of new hope. <laughs> These basic things that, that in so many ways we take for granted. That the way in which we, we nurture a different kind of Christian or post-Christian kind of communal sense of ethics and identity, that needs to be shared in order to be held. It needs memories that we develop with one another, whether it's through participation in marches, whether it's our participation in broader issues of advocacy, but also in the rituals that, around which we gather. That's how we come to a new sense of hope. Right? Community is vital to that. The practice of church is, I think, vital to that. And if in the parables the kingdom of God is encountered in the midst of the world, in the midst of the unexpected one, and in, in, in the, in the impure one, then contemporary prayer seeks to nurture our capacity for seeing, for seeing the unexpected in the world in ways beyond what Merton might have envisaged, perhaps more in the way of Joan Chittister or a Pima Chodron would envisage. Imagine the differences in one's perception of communion, of the table, if one viewed it as a practice of community so that one might better live the virtues of respect and equal regard and welcome in the rest of one's personal and public life. The church is a place that nurtures trust and confidence to participate in the wider world. Church is a place that also helps us to ask questions of our faith, to develop not just a questioning but even a questionable faith, willing to hold one another in the most difficult situations and in the midst of the most difficult questions. By putting the parables at the heart of our prayer and practice, we challenge one another to hear in a new key what the gospel is asking of us now. That's my reflections for this workshop. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask a question about that other wonderful parable, um, the prodigal son, and about what we learn about forgiveness. And I suppose I was responding also to your talking about the practice of and one of the things that strikes me about forgiveness, if you look at someone like Derrida's writings, and Holloway, of course, took that as a starting point for his book on forgiveness, you really can only understand forgiveness as the uh, capacity to forgive what is normally being labelled as unforgivable. Whereas in everyday life, we have to exercise that capacity to forgive again and again. And we do get better at it. It's like you're exercising a muscle of some kind. But like most acts of forgiveness, you also find yourself thinking, actually, I'm not feeling very forgiving at the moment about that issue. It's like it comes back on you, so you have to do it again. And of course, it's that that also enables you, and this is about prayer, really, to be more forgiving of self when you realise how fundamental that capacity to, um, well, to, to behave in ways that require forgiveness, but that how human it is too. So I don't quite know what my question is, but I think it's that kind of insight that probably is the one that's helpful for all of us, in a sense. But by all means, please comment on it. Um. I love Hannah Arendt's uh, discussion of forgiveness, and it's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm blanking now for a moment on which volume it's, uh, it's in. Um, but, um, <clears throat> and she says, well, we simply need a model of forgiveness to begin again because we're always stepping on one another and we're inadvertently doing this or that or hurting one, and so there, there needs to be a social mechanism by which um, civil life and civil society can continue in the midst of these kind of, even if they're inadver inadvertent kind of, of uh, problems. I, yes, but I think the, the other piece, and then I'll, I'll just kind of keep this, this uh, short, is that forgiveness can be difficult 
at points because, and I would say, uh, there, there oftentimes needs to be some confrontation before there's some forgiveness, right? Now, I don't want to get too much into practical theology or even therapy here, but, but oftentimes um, we're, we're sometimes, uh, this is true of some friends I've known who've dealt with some sexual abuse in their life, and they, they simply want to go right to forgiveness. And they've got some very good therapists that say, you know, sometimes by wanting to move right to forgiveness, you end up trying to be in a kind of denial, a kind of you, you cover over a wound too quickly. And so there can be some, some, some very thoughtful and important uh, considerations to give to that discourse of forgiveness. Yeah. Um, uh, no, nonetheless, it, it is also an important kind of uh, capacity for renewal in public life. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering what your hope, what you would hope to achieve in prayer or liturgy in the sense that if you uh, do you hope to communicate with a sky god or do you hope to communicate with a mystery or do you hope just to feel good in a congregation mm -hmm. what what goes on and what are you trying to tre to achieve right uh, that's wonderful. At, at one level, um, in, in this kind of, of setting, um, I suspect we have some different theologies and different, different kinds of interests, different models of God. Um, so there are, there are in, in most congregations, there are going to be uh, still some folks who kind of operate out of a classical kind of model. There's going to be uh, some folks who really operate out of a, a more panentheistic model where God is envisioned in the midst of life. And that has a very different kind of sensibility, a very different kind of language than petitioning God to intervene from outside to change things. And you're, you're also in a, in a more progressive community going to be dealing with, with uh, folks who are in some ways uh, quite perhaps disenchanted with the language of God because of the way in which it has been used in social structures, political structures to abuse. And, and therefore you have people kind of in a liminal state in terms of whether, to what extent they want to affirm that reality and how. Um, but there's any number of, of kind of both philosophical and theological kind of models to enable that uh, a, a discourse of God. So I think really one of the challenges of, of ministry, uh, especially in a more progressive community, is to actually surface some theological discussion, not bury it, but surface some theological discussion so that in some certain, in, in, to, in a range of some theological models so that we all can claim responsibility for negotiating them. Because too often it simply falls to the pastor to, to kind of negotiate this language by herself, by himself, and then, and, and then people come and complain. It's like, well, <laughs> let's say, it's like, folks, this is why for, for me, really, it's, it's important that um, I was doing with this a bit more in Melbourne. I'll talk about it a little bit more today. Can't do, go into great detail, but it's much more important that we, that we all begin, that we democratize theology so that we all feel that we have some capacity to engage this important discourse that should and, and that inevitably does inform our practice, right? Even if nobody's talking about a theology, the way in which we practice a liturgy, the way in which the language we use, the, the structure, the way in which we seat around our, ourselves in a sanctuary, all those things communicate a sense of order, a sense of who's in, perhaps a sense of who's out. So this is why we need in our communities to begin to do some initial conversations of, of theology. What does that mean for a people of faith to, re to reflect on and to begin to articulate a proposal of this is how we understand our faith tradition and what it is calling us to. And if we can begin to do that, then we can all take, then we can all begin to take some responsibility for how we are interpreting that language. 
right? And for many of us, once we surface that discourse in a community, we're all going to be going, oh, I never thought of that before. I've never been encouraged to think about this before. I've never, I don't even know if I have, I mean, I have students who come to seminary saying, am I allowed to think about this? Still, they might be 35, 40 years old, and they come out of a theology lecture on, on the platonic stuff, and they're completely discombobulated by it, and they say, now, do, can, I'm not even sure I have permission to think about this. And I say to myself, sweet Jesus, I mean, we, I mean this is the, but this is the importance of the work. This is why it's important to try to, to articulate uh, these challenges of faith and to enable people to experience both the challenge but also their capacity to respond to it. Thank you. I do get going. Yeah. Um, a parable. Um, I yes. had a holiday on my own uh, without my partner. And when I got back, which was two weeks ago, the house was completely repainted. The bedroom is now not where I used to sleep, it's the room next door. There are shelves everywhere, the wardrobes are gone, the whole interior of the house has changed and the front door has changed colour. It's not crimson now, it's grey. And um, wow. I was not consulted about that. I was told that changes were going to happen but I didn't participate in this. And I was thinking about what you said this morning about our search for stability. Yeah. It has been so dis destabilizing yeah. for me. Um, and I f have felt like there's nobody that I can really talk to about it because really it sort of reflects something that's happening inside the relationship. Yeah. Um, and I, my theory is it's to do with a grief reaction because his father died recently, so there's yeah, a whole lot of yeah. stuff that needed cleaning out there, but right. my life's been cleaned out as well. Yeah. But just putting it yeah. in that context, I like what you said yeah. about the table, the shared communion, and it struck me that that's what you're saying about prayer as well, that yeah. somehow um, it's being in a community where we all share our differing experiences of destabilizing mm. life. And somehow by sharing that, we gain a sense of strength, not certainty. We don't gain certainty, but right. we gain right. an ability to mm. live with uncertainty. And yes. I think that's what, when people get up and pray here and they have the microphone, the theologies are all different, the God views are all different, everybody's come at it in a different way, but each prayer is somehow a reflection of their concerns, their feelings of lostness, their feeling of, of the world is not perfect, you know, and, yes. and it's very fulfilling to have that sense of a shared, destabilised life. Right. Yes, I think you should give the next talk. I mean, I, just, <laughs> I think that's, a, that's a, it's really a, no, it's, it's just, again, beautifully said. Um, thank you. Joe, I've got the microphone this time. Yeah. I was thinking about that, um, West, I think it's Westminster Confession, where it's um, in non-inclusive language that the chief end of man is to worship God and glorify him together, or forever. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the way a lot of people have understood what worship is, you know, that, that, yes. that it's all kind of going up. So if you had to write a new catechism, not that we want to do that, but sure. how would you just talk, talk, you know, is there a way of encapsulating what we are doing in worship? Um, and that can also help us, because I think sometimes people in more progressive communities feel a bit judged that we're not worshipping God enough, you know, that oh. we're, we're too focused on, on the world. Um, yeah, so... Is there a way that you, that you would articulate sort of bringing those things together that is still about sort of the, the, the mystery um, and, yes. the, and the public life? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, perhaps over between last night and today, you're, you're also hearing that what I'm trying to hold together is this discourse of the, of the political and the religious. Um, and I do view them as overlapping discourses. And I view them as discourses that deal with the sacred because they are the discourses that deal with uh, 
the gathering of a people. And again, we're, we're so used to being disappointed in our public life, it's, and by public practice and our politicians, we have a difficult time imagining uh, that this is sacred activity. But it is, it's, it's primal activity, and it's, and it's dependent on the way in which we engage and act with one another and how we begin to, to have a kind of respect for one another. And certainly, even in the, the church, can devolve into, uh, by virtue of its own conventions, its own kind of moralistic habits, also into a place where people are not respected, where, where not all voices are, are welcomed, where again, so for me, over the last 60 years, we've, we've had an amazing range of, of political theologies that have again and again said, now wait a minute, let's rethink this basic topic of who's created in the image of God again? Is it males? Is it white males? Is it, or are women also created in the image of God? Are people of color also created in the image of God? Are people from third world? And what about the post-colonial theologies where Christian theology has run roughshod over aboriginal voices and over other peoples? How do you begin to undo that? So one of the ways in which over the last 60 years we've seen, I think, important steps in theology is that theologians are not simply, we're not simply updating an outdated theology as Merton talks about. We're also beginning to see that our theological traditions are part of the problem, right? And so once that's the case, once it's the way in which, oh yes, the way in which we privilege humanity as being created in the image of God ends up enabling a whole kind of theology and philosophy and practices that disregard the earth, right? So we've got to rethink some of those pieces as well as the maleness of God, the whiteness of God. And <clears throat> so what that means um, for me, and I tried to kind of hint at this in the talk, is to say that, again, any model of creation, of a presence of the sacred in the midst of all reality, cannot simply lock a church or should not simply lock a sense of worship or engagement into a particular denominational, doctrinal a set of assertions. It, it, it inevitably, one is called out of that. The whole experience of the practice of a community, and this is where I think the political image is helpful, the, the, the practice of, of, a, of being a community that can trust and not distrust one another, of being a place where we practice listening to one another, where we practice in some sense surfacing a kind of a, the, the, the differences of our theology precisely in order to rehearse them, precisely in order to see where we connect and listen better to one another. That that whole process of reflecting on the sacred is itself a preparation for an engagement of, again, where we really encounter God in, in the mystery of life in the broader public discourse. And, and that's where we can be and ought to be a transformative presence within the public life. But we're also listening and saying, well, why in God's name does, this, does the society, does, does bad old secular humanism seem to be ahead of where the church is when it comes to dealing with GLBTQI rights? Why does the society seem to be in some ways ahead of us when it comes to dealing with civil rights? And we in the church are still hunkering down with a kind of, our own kind of racist tendencies, which of course we never talk about in church. So there, so I think the, my theology would be to say that we, that we encounter the holy in all of life and that what the, the true importance of church is that we are in the practice of genuinely trying to learn how to do that more thoughtfully, more respectfully, more in, in greater sense of honor, not just of the sacred, but of, the, of, of, the hum, of humanity and the world, which, are the, which that's the calling. That's, that's the calling of, of us. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah. I want to uh, just relate um, a panel discussion that I came across on the internet where there were some American theologians, and I can't remember their names, but I think they must have been quite prominent. But one made the case for the church's work having been finished. Huh. 
uh, finished in the sense that it has now spilt out into secular society, particularly in Europe. I don't think he was specifically referring to America as such mm -hmm. because of the strong political structures mm -hmm. and the alliance of religion with politics. But he was more or less saying in Europe, in hospital, in health, in schools, you know, the churches might be empty, but the, the church's ethos of community building mm -hmm. has, has spilled out. Uh -huh. The churches are emptying, but society generally uh, has benefited yes. and, and it's, it's the, the values are there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I relate that to my own feeling that wherever good community is found, and it might be down at the pool at the beach where people gather every morning in Sydney and uh, they might be a coalition of friends. So wherever good community is found, that is, that is community yeah. building. Yeah. Um, but it's in particular reference to the church's work is done, is yeah. done that Good. I just want to get a response. Thank you. You know, um, now I'm, 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 I've, I've turned 60 recently, so my, my memory, I go for a name and it's, it's just not there. But um, I have a neighbor uh, where I lived at recently, this is in the last couple of years, uh, kind, of a, kind of a community, um, uh, you know, um, uh, I've just, but anyway, a, a neighbor who uh, is a professor of religion who makes a similar argument. I'll come up with his name in a second. But he was looking, he said, you know, the, the problem, uh, and it's almost kind of agreeing with you, is that the social gospel movement in particular, uh, perhaps in the United States, but, but elsewhere perhaps, um, actually began to take folks who had been interested in ministry in a family line where a father had been a son and father and their grandfather had been ministers. Suddenly, due to the impact of the social gospel, which was saying we need to transform civil society, their children were becoming lawyers and doctors and involved in other kind of, of humane projects. And, and as a result, there were there was a, some, a, something of a brain drain away from, from theology into, out of a theological call, into, into to, to transforming the world, and that that transformation had also led to folks um, who were very much involved in, in ethics and in the transformation of civil society, but they weren't in the church anymore. So, and again, in his argument, you do see um, both a lament, a sense that the, on, on the one hand that the church may have fulfilled its role by moving people into public life, although I'm not sure this person would say that. There's also a certain sadness that the church has lost voices that it needs in order to continue its own prophetic work. That the sense that the prophetic work is done I think is where I would make the challenge in terms of saying, well, we need to um, really seriously re-identify um, the challenge to which the church, especially progressives, need to be a prophetic voice. Um, but um, I'll, I'll, as, when I come up with a name, I'll try to get it back to you. Uh, but that's, yes. Um, thank you very much for your discussion. Um, two points. Um, firstly, um, I think voices that are often not heard is churches outside of mainstream churches that are founded in LGBTIQ communities, yep. Aboriginal communities, yep. um, liberation theology communities. Yep. Um, so um, my first question is um, how can uh, mainstream um, churches uh, engage um, in churches outside um, who are often ahead um, in terms of LGBTI issues, in terms yeah. of etc. That's my first question because yes. it's often the struggle of churches outside of mainstream churches trying to engage in dialogue with mainstream churches. That's the first point. The second point is um, 
would you be able to expand on um, the practice of parables? Um, because I think um, the benefit of um, the practice of parables in worship is, um, I can, you know, I can think of like Matthew 13, um, Matthew 13, 31, 32, uh, in relation to the parable of the mustard seed, said that even if faith is little, it can often be the greatest of, of faith. Um, and the purpose of parables can often be a great way um, of educating the ignorant when you can't necessarily talk in plain English. So, um, yeah, could you expand on those two points? Um. Maybe, yes. Um, <laughs> the, um, so the, the first one again, just in, uh, so it, uh, is involves... Uh, in relation, how can... Main... Uh, the first question is, how can interfaith dialogue take Got place it. between yes. mainstream churches and interfaith churches dialogue? outside... Right. Yeah, interfaith dialogue oh, between yeah, yeah, mainstream yeah. churches sure. and churches outside of mainstream churches. Sure. Second question is in yeah, relation okay. to yeah. praxis of parables. Yes. Um, now, interreligious dialogue can mean, like, typically means, in, in my way of speaking, um, Christians talking to Buddhists, Christians talking to, or do you mean cross denominational discourse as well? All right. Yes. And I think, first of all, I, I, it's, it's an important question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. Because, again, it, it, it has people have to be comfortable enough with the difference that they would in entertain in order to be willing to do so. Um, now, again, um, Brandon uh, Scott has, uh, for over the last 20 years, with, with mainline communities, Disciples of Christ, Lutherans, um, I'm not sure how many Baptist churches have invited him. Depends on who invites you in some cases but has talked about homosexuality in the Bible and, and probably delivered that talk hundreds of times. Um, and there's other scholars who are, so in some ways one, one sometimes needs folks from outside a community so that, the, so that the minister doesn't feel like her or his job is, or their job is on the line. Um, but to, to help bring up a topic that's difficult point of conversation in order for folks to begin to say, well, you know, I really hadn't thought about that at all. We never talk about that. And now that I see some, have some intellectual perspective, sure, maybe, maybe we, there can be some, some movement here. But communities of faith themselves, and this is true of mainline denominations as well as um, perhaps even, it's a bit, might even be a bit worse in more conservative traditions, is there's a kind of, there can be a kind of a, a cone of silence about what we don't talk about here. And it can be very difficult to, to broach a subject, uh, a difficult one, a painful one, uh, without being kind of moralistically shut down. Uh, without there being some percentage of a congregation then going to a pastor and say, how dare you raise this issue? And, and, and just, you know. And so it's um, what, what I think is helpful, and, but, but of course I'm, I'm an academic, what else would I say? Uh, is I sometimes really do think that we need um, folks who are in some sense by virtue of work in the classroom or other places, they're a little bit more used to, to being an augmenting voice in a community that says, it's time for us to discuss this. Could you help us do this in some way? Could you provide something of a venue? Um, sometimes that's, that's helpful. The other thing that can be helpful perhaps is if there is a, 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 an interfaith organization or a, a, or a, or a community group of pastors, where the pastors themselves begin to say, you know, we need to make some headway on this. And if there can be those kind of communities where, again, um, those, those conversations can be at least thought about tactically, strategically, with others that one trusts. But this is also why I'm, I'm convinced that we have to democratize our discussion of, of, of theology. So that there's more people, lay people, we, we begin to surface those issues as things to be thought and talked about. And people who, can't, who don't have the maturity to do so, they can leave uh, and may need to leave. But, but we need to begin to encourage more mature conversations. 
Um, now the second point, geez, I apologize, I just must be a bit tired here, but the, your, the second point was also on the... Practice of parables. Practice of parables. Yeah. Well, yes. How can we How can include we do more that? parables in um, church worship? Well, I think that's... Yes. The There's, um, we were just at a community in Newcastle where this is a pastor who about once a month is very interested in art, um, brings in another artist that will be there for a month, and there will be an installation of their artwork, and basically he treats that artwork as a kind of parable that's going to be interpreted in sermon and in prayer language, and there's going to be this engagement of of art as a way of opening up other kinds of issues and topics and, and then the, the rest of the liturgy to a kind of, hmm, uh, to, to an engagement with that. With that. And, and I think that reminds me, or that speaks to me of the parable, because again, there's ways in which once we identify the dynamic of a particular parable, we might say, we're going to focus on this parable for the next month and the different ways in which that can kind of play itself out. And whether it's if we have adult Sunday schools or whether we just do kind of, here's how this, we're going to develop this theme this week or that. The, and we can look at New Testament parables. We can also look at more contemporary parables, right? So I loved it that uh, Bob Funks, one of his books that I uh, love from years ago was Jesus' Precursor in which he talks about the parables and then he puts that in conversation with all the other kind of modern parabolists like Kafka and Borges and, and, and others. And uh, so there's ways in which the parable form that we're engaging in a worship or community service might not have to be one of Jesus' parables, but by, ana by, by analogy, a set of others. And the key for me would be, how do, we, how do we use that language to open up a sense of prayer, to open up a sense of insight that, that where we can hear the challenge, but then also the invitation to respond differently. So I, I really do think that, that in that sense, praying the parables uh, and practicing the parables can, I should probably write more about that than less, but I should probably uh, you know, keep studying. Thank you. Mine is more of a, an observation that I've noticed over the years between the different uh, church bodies. And you either go to church to make friends or you, you go to church to make enemies. Oh. And that the latter is sad because um, I don't think the, the guys grace of God does work everywhere you would like it to work sometimes. So it's just a way of observation. Yes. Well, I, <clears throat> I take it you've experienced both kinds of communities. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that's, that's certainly not the only way to divide, to, to think about communities there. Um, but um, but, but I'll take it as a cautionary warning about that. <laughs> thank you, Ian, and thank you, Joe. Yeah.